Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Williams with the Kern National Network for Caring and Character in Medicine, or KNN. And I am thrilled to welcome you all to the fourth and final session in this year's discussion series, Human Flourishing 2030, Flourishing in the Learning Environment. Very briefly, for those who are not already familiar with the KNN, we're a national movement focused on integrating four foundational elements within the profession of medicine, caring, character, practical wisdom, and human flourishing. Promoting human flourishing is our central aspiration, and we believe that requires creating learning and practice environments where those within can grow, reach their full potential, and help others do the same. To that end, the Canon has three main priorities shown here that span the health ecosystem. We pursue those priorities through efforts with and across our founding member schools listed along the bottom of the slide, as well as many others across the broader health ecosystem. Today, we're excited and grateful to have leaders, faculty, and learners from across those groups participating in the conversation. Throughout this discussion series, we've explored flourishing and the factors that influence it in a variety of different contexts and settings, from communities to organizations and clinical spaces. In this session, we'll return to our roots to focus on transforming medical and health professions education to create more positive, inclusive learning environments that enable flourishing. But what do we really mean by flourishing? Let's take a moment to unpack that before the panel begins. The KNN's integrated framework diagram, the tree that you're seeing on this slide, shows our theory for how several foundational elements can work together to create a path toward flourishing, which we view as a wholeness of being and doing. The tree as a whole represents the entire concept of flourishing, suggesting growth, change, and organic development. Like a tree's strong trunk and branches allow for healthy leaves, the interconnected concepts of caring, character, and practical wisdom support human flourishing. Yet we also recognize that flourishing isn't a static thing. It's not a destination you arrive at or stay forever, but rather it's something that ebbs and flows and evolves over the course of life. That's why you'll see the leaves are changing colors in the diagram much like our leaves here in the Midwest are currently. So how did the different elements contribute? Let's first consider caring. In medicine, we often think of care as the treatment that's provided, health care. Instead, using an expanded definition, the Canon views caring as an ongoing practice and approach that encourages growth, development, and more caring systems, like the educational system, and societies as well. Next, the KNN sees embracing character as shaping environments where individuals are able to use and continually strengthen the building blocks of character. Traits like compassion, courage, humility, and many others over the course of their careers. And not only where they are able to do so, but actively encouraged and supported in that. And finally, practical wisdom is something continually developed through experience, reflection, and integration. We see it as using acquired experience and judgment to discern the best path forward and apply principles of caring and character to particular situations. Together, these interrelated concepts offer a potential path toward flourishing. So as we explore flourishing within the learning environment, we'll focus on a few different areas. Strategies for infusing flourishing into learning experiences, ways such practices can be incorporated into curricula and philosophies of education, and the role of learners, how they can be both agents and beneficiaries of flourishing. Very shortly, we'll hear panelists' thoughts on what this could look like in educational settings. But we would like to ask you and to hear your perspectives as well. So I'll ask you to picture a learning environment that encourages flourishing. What is a word or two that comes to mind? Please take a moment and share that word or those words in the chat after taking a moment or two to consider that. So I'll give you just a second to kind of think about what does flourishing, what does a flourishing environment mean? 
um, for you. So inclusive, ability to hear and incorporate feedback, agency, learners talking, safe, joyful, listening, diverse growth, playful, cooperation, ability to contribute, engagement, supportive, empathetic, psychologically safe and brave spaces, curiosity is encouraged, sense of belonging, comfortable, compassionate. These are all words that are making me want to be part of that learning environment too. And so we invite you to keep thinking, keep sharing throughout the session, and hold those in your mind as we open to our panel today. So to dive further into themes and topics and how we can start to move towards a learning environment like what you've just described, we are so grateful to have an incredible panel here with us. Our moderator and Canon founding board member, Dr. Catherine Lucy of UCSF School of Medicine. We have Dr. Michelle Guy of the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Stuart Slavin of the ACGME and student Dr. Saba Anwar from the Medical College of Wisconsin and Isabel Tercio of the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. So just two quick housekeeping notes before our panelists take the stage. First, we encourage you to select the speaker view shown here for the best viewing experience. And second, many of our panelists will be available for questions following the main program. So please feel free to submit your questions at any time by chatting them directly to Q&A and we'll get those queued up for the end of the session. And at this time, we will begin our panel discussion in earnest. So Catherine, I will turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that wonderful introduction and summary of the KNN framework for caring character professional uh, uh, human flourishing and phronesis or practical wisdom. Um, I'm really excited to be able to moderate this session and I wanna first um, turn the first question to uh, Michelle Guy and Stuart Slavin. We've actually agreed to use everyone's first name. So um, Michelle and Stuart, thank you so much for joining us. You both have extensive experience in both undergraduate and graduate medical education and continuing medical education. Um, so I just ask you to sort of, um, think for a moment, the questions we ask the other people and talk about what does human flourishing look like in the learning environments in which you're, you are in? And after this, we'll turn it over to our students for their on the ground answers. Yeah, I'll go first. Thanks, Catherine. Um, you know, I'll start with just what my roles are so that you understand a context in which I'm coming from. So I am clinically a primary care physician as well as an obesity medicine specialist. So I take care of patients there. But as a medical educator, I also am part of um, the GME program. So I'm the director of diversity for graduate medical education. And then I also do a lot of faculty development. So I work with our anti-oppression curriculum initiative as the associate director for faculty development. Um, when I think about flourishing, I think not only focusing on our students, but also on our faculty. And how can our faculty really encourage the mm -hmm. learning environment for the student to flourish? Um, but I'll take a step back. I think about when I was a medical student and um, what it would have looked like if I felt like I was flourishing. Uh, you know, in the first two years, it was really difficult for me because I didn't see myself as like, I thought my superpower would be working with patients. And I didn't get to do that in the first two years, especially um, coming out of college two years and then um, being a, um, a literature major, I wasn't prepared for all the science and so forth. So I didn't feel like I was in my element. Um, so I think having the, the student be able to use all of their talents, their life experiences and their identities right as they come in and to be able to see how that will um, influence and, and, and help them be better clinicians and educators and be part of that working environment so that they can use all the skills and abilities that they come with from the get-go and be able to understand how important that is. I think mm -hmm. too, just having a sense of, not just a sense of belonging, but also being told you belong. I think not often enough that we you know, verbalize to students that we, we want you here. And yes, you're not gonna look like the person next to you or the other person in front of you because we want a variety of talents. And so we don't expect everyone to be at the same level, you know, to start in the same place. And, um, and so 
you know, normalizing that as a path, I think is really important. So contribution and belonging, um, and that, and also contribution that starts from day one. I really love those thinking. Um, Stuart, how, how about you? How are you thinking about human flourishing in the learning environment? So just a couple of words of introduction. So my current position is um, Senior Scholar for Wellbeing at the ACGME. Um, but a lot of my perspective on this issue really came from when I was the um, Dean for Curriculum at St. Louis University some years ago and, and kind of made it my mission to work on, on student well-being while I was there. And so a couple of the things that um, Michelle already said, I would completely agree with, right? That sense of belonging, no matter your identity, you mm -hmm. feel um, deeply that, that, that you're there and, and deserve to be there and are, are, are the right place, I think is, is incredibly important. Um, for me, a couple of others that I think um, that that I think are important is is that that students feel some kind of sense of balance between the the demands and pressure that they're under and and the resources um, both external and internal that they bring to it, so that they feel like that like this is doable, <laughs> you know, not only doable but that they can have a life outside of school too. I think is really important. And the other one, I guess I would say that I think has always been kind of important to me is, is that they have a sense of meaning and purpose in, in their studies, in their school, that it isn't just kind of, um, they're not they're just there to kind of pack their brains with information and develop skills, but that they have some opportunity to experience um, medicine in a way that, that taps into that sense of meaning and purpose. To me, those are huge. Terrific. Um, we're going to turn to our student experts now. And um, while they represent two distinguished medical schools, I want to emphasize they're not speaking for their schools. They're speaking as individuals who have traversed the medical education um, ecosystem for a while and have lots of colleagues across the country with, with um, I'm sure, who they've interacted with and have talked about these issues of the clinical learning environment, the classroom learning environment. So I'm going to start with our fourth year student, Isabel. Um, so Isabel, you want to introduce yourself and then um, what I'd like you to do is sort of say, what do you think faculty should know, particularly one specific thing that could help improve student flourishing uh, based on your conversations with your classmates and also um, similar, similar students across the country? So we'll start with Isabel, who is a fourth year student at Geisel, um, and then we'll move to Saba, who's a second year student at Medical College of Wisconsin. Isabel? Yes, thank you. So I'm Isabel. Um, I'm a fourth year student here at Dartmouth applying into pediatrics, uh, particularly I have an interest in child advocacy and medical education. And during my time here at Dartmouth, I've been able to do a lot of DEI work um, as well as work um, in the sphere of student wellness and well-being. And I think for me, it, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to say one thing that could be done to improve student flourishing, but a lot of people in the chat have already said it. So, you know, creating psychologically safe, comfortable, inclusive spaces and all the other great adjectives that were thrown into the chat. Um, I think from a student perspective, especially during the clinical years, um, it's, it's really tough for a lot of students to stay grounded um, and not let the pressures of conforming to um, the, the, the healthcare world and what they think a doctor should look like um, and, and turn them something into someone who they don't recognize. I think there's a lot of psychological stress that comes with assimilating um, and wanting to look and sound uh, professional. And I say this, especially for, for those students who enter clerkships and um, the clinical years who are underrepresented in, in medicine, um, because they're are already usually um, overwhelmed with feelings of imposter syndrome um, and needing to sort of suppress or change their identity in a way that is palatable um, for the rest of, of medicine. But I think it's important for faculty and clinicians to sort of support these identities because those are the aspects that make a lot of people even better clinicians and more relatable um, for their pa uh, patients. And so I think it's easy for students to 
start living and breathing medicine and it feels like a black hole and um, like there's no light at the other side. And I think one way that, you know, students can can feel that they have some meaning and aren't losing who um, they like came into medical school as um, is to, you know, remember that it's okay to be yourself. Um, medicine is not who you are. Um, it's a part of what you do. Um, and, and just encouraging people to express their individual individuality, especially underrepresented minorities. Um, thank you for that. Really wonderful words of wisdom. I wonder, um, given, as you said, you, you're going into pediatrics, I wonder to what extent did the um, environments of flourishing help you decide what specialty to go into? Did, did you see a difference um, amongst the different specialties um, that made you move in one direction or the other? 100%. Um, I actually was going to apply into general surgery. And when I took a step back to sort of look at the people I was surrounded about around and what their values were after talking with various residents and attendings and kind of write down and bounce ideas off of, you know, my closest friends about um, who I am and, and like sort of what I want to see in medicine. And those things just didn't align um, for me. And so uh, talking to all the pediatric uh, residents and attendings, I just felt so welcomed by the entire specialty. I've been to several institutions now on away rotations um, in New York and Washington, D.C., and across the board, everybody has just been so welcoming. And I think being being in the in the, you know, specialty of pediatrics, I think a lot of pediatricians want their patients to flourish and, and become whoever they are going to become. And so I think it's very natural for them to do the same for medical students. And so I'm very biased and will say that they are the model right now for, um, you know, how flourishing could look like and, and be supported, um, you know, from a medical student perspective. Fantastic. Thank you for saying that. And good luck on your interviews. Um, Saba, um, what do you think? Um, you're a little bit earlier in the curriculum, but I know um, you've had some clinical exposure through your doctoring classes and things like that. But I'm wondering um, how you think about flourishing, particularly in the classroom, and especially when you're studying hard to master all that foundational science. Oh, that's right. Um, so I, I'm Saba, I'm a uh, second year. So further behind than Isabel, I'm uh, at the Medical College of Wisconsin, the Milwaukee campus. And um, I've actually had the opportunity to be a part of a current supported project where we're developing a cultural humility course. And I also have um, been heavily involved in projects trying to bring medical humanities to medical students to encourage it flourishing in that way. I actually um, just volunteered at a nursing home this weekend where we painted with the seniors and it was just um, a really fun way to escape um, just the sphere of medicine um, and just engage with people in a completely different way and do something that everyone enjoys. Um, and I, I really resonated with the person who commented finding joy or creating this joyful space, because I believe that's really important. Um, but to your question on my perspective, uh, somebody still in my preclinical years, I think it's really important um, that faculty try and create an environment where there's some shared vulnerability. I think for a lot of medical students, you spend all of these years trying to get the perfect grades, trying to do a lot of extracurriculars, trying to be perfect in the way that you present yourself, and it's a lot of pressure. And I think at a certain point, doing well on exams becomes um, not just what you do, but almost a part of who you are or how you find acceptance. And the problem with this is that when you fall short, it can feel absolutely devastating. Um, for me last year, and this is more clinical, but after our first OSCEs, I was worried that the patient didn't like me. And that was, those are my exact thoughts, doesn't like me. So it felt very personal. <laughs> um, and it was really easy for me in that moment to just catastrophize in this thing, like, okay, if I can't build this connection, like, can I be a physician and just spiral? Um, 
And so it was just in my head. And actually somebody on faculty, I think, noticed that I looked a little bit shaken up. And actually this person took the time to tell me about when they were first a young attending and um, a patient had negative feedback for them, but they were really authentic in telling me how it made them feel and how they reacted. And it meant so much to me because I think um, in medicine, we really look to our attendings and our faculty almost on this pedestal and you see all these brilliant, successful people and it's really difficult to see them in your shoes. And so in a way, when you sort of create this shared vulnerability, you feel like your dreams are more achievable. You realize that behind every successful person, there have been a few missteps along the way. And sometimes it's helpful to be reminded of that, that you can still get to the point you need to, even if you're not there right now. So for me, as someone early in my career, it really meant a lot to me. And so I, I think that's important, just especially in terms of just helping us nurture more of a growth mindset uh, mm -hmm. and veer away from that catastrophizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a um, really wonderful thing. I think the shared vulnerability and and also having the faculty know to put themselves in your shoes um, is is clearly an important skill. I'm going to um, ask first the students and then the, the faculty we have with us today. Um, I was listening and I thought to myself, well, we have all of these positive words that talk about a flourishing environment, but I'm wondering um, a couple things and you can take either question. One is, um, what are um, what are barriers to flourishing? Each of you has touched on it a little bit. So the absence of belonging, but Saba was getting into sort of also a little bit of the mindset uh, mindset of who gets into medical school. And then the other question I want to throw out to the group is: um, Are our systems set up for everyone to flourish, or are they designed for some people to flourish um, and have it necessarily incorporated everyone who needs to flourish? And that might either that be different students or faculty or even staff. So um, why don't we start with Isabel again, um, and then we'll um, go to Saba, Michelle, and Stuart. Yeah, I think your your last point about our systems set up um you know to have everyone in this space flourish is an, is is a really good one because i think simply the answer is no i think we live in a very um inequitable society and um medical school and medicine is is not immune to that at all um i think a lot of um students and i will speak from um as a person of color and as a woman of color um, you know, I think I come from a background, I'm an immigrant where I didn't have the resources to, um, you know, do well. I, I had to ask a lot of people for, um, you know, secondhand things or ask the school um, to help fund some study resources for me. Um, and I think, as we all know, a lot of people um, might come into med medical school already set up to flourish in a lot of different ways. Um, and so recognizing that, you know, just telling your students, hey, use these resources is, is not enough um, to, to help people really succeed. Um, sometimes you have to ask really hard questions about why someone is not, quote unquote, succeeding. I think success looks a lot of different ways, which is why I use quotations there. Um, and, and I think finally, in, in the clinical sphere, I think how people are, are treated, honestly, as medical students um, hinders that type of flourishing. And so, um, you know, if I walk into a service and all of a sudden everyone's ignoring me or, you know, talking to me like I hadn't done a single day of medical school, you know, that's, that's, it's making me look incompetent. It's really embarrassing. Um, you know, feelings of imposter syndrome come up again, whereas, um, you know, my colleague walks in and everyone is, is, is treating them, you know, um, like they're basically a, a co-resident, you know, it, and you see that, you know, and so I think it has a huge effect on, you know, your ability to, to be yourself and to flourish and to have all those positive feelings that come with this field or can come with this field. Yeah, so you're so um, right about issues of marginalization or underestimation for whatever reason. And, and then of course, um, what I like about what you said in particular is, you know, it, uh, flourishing becomes an element of equity or equity should include a concept of flourishing, right? If, if we, and we think about this concept of, of health is not just the absence of illness, right? Um, and flourishing isn't just the absence of those negative things, but those negative things actually really do 
um, disadvantage people because you can't really flourish if you don't feel respected. So just, just a lovely description, Isabel. Thank you for that. Saba, um, your thoughts? What Isabel said really resonated with me as well. Um, I think when you when you have to walk into a room where no one else looks like you, you really have to put in a little bit of extra effort from yourself because you're not necessarily walking into a room that's very receptive. Um, and actually in this particular instance of the OSCE, I think um, what people may be surprised to realize is when you are a person of color, sometimes you do have this extra fear of, is this person not going to like me based on what they see? Um, and that's something that, you know, I've, I've dealt with, um, as a minority, my, myself, um, and it's actually one of the reasons I was shaken up after that particular, uh, story that I had previously mentioned. And so, um, I absolutely don't think the playing field is, is equal. Um, one thing that I really noticed during our, our white coat ceremony is how many students, um, come from families where, um, their parents are physicians or their parents and grandparents are physicians. And um, for people that are immigrants or don't have that background or don't have that support, there's this whole element of having to navigate the educational system and know what to do next um, to without um, some of that guidance or even being part of that environment, it's difficult to know from the get go that you need to do certain activities or join in research. And, and so I think in that way, um, the playing field certainly isn't equal. And if there was a way to ensure that some of this information was better distributed um, and that people that don't necessarily have these almost inborn support systems are not disadvantaged because of where they come from or their families. So that's my thought. Uh, thank you for that, Saba. And um, we know that um, um, Isabel actually had to drop off to take care of an important community event at her institution. Um, uh, Stuart and Michelle, I'm wondering, um, how are you reacting to these, um, these um, really wise words from our students? And, and I'd, I'd love you also to talk a little bit about, uh, maybe start with that, and then also we'll follow with a question about faculty flourishing and faculty skills and facilitating other people flourishing. So let, let's start just with a reaction to the students, your own thoughts about who is left out of our current environments and, and what does it look like when you felt an environment either as a faculty or as a student wasn't quite optimal. You wanna start Stu and then we'll- yeah. move No, I think this, the students are absolutely on target and maybe I'll add kind of something to that perspective that I think kind of echoes what they're talking about. Um, and, and Saba saying it's not a level playing field. I mean, we, we continue, the reality is at many places we continue to use metrics um, too heavily multiple choice, you know, standardized multiple choice exams that frankly are, are more reflective of, of privilege and social capital than they are of any potential. I mean, we, which is kind of sad that we continue to, to do that. Um, and um, it's not a level playing field and, and, and the importance of those factors I think are really important. I mean, I, I really do believe that faculty can play a role. I mean, one of the things that I used to say when I was interacting with first year students first week of medical school was to say um, that don't let these exams, um, you know, don't believe it's it's who you are. It's, it's, it's how you're performing, but that performance has little traction later in life. And I, I would say that, um, Never in my career as a pediatrician did anyone ever ask me which of the following diagnoses do I have, A, B, C, D, or E. You know, medicine is not a multiple choice exam. And so I think we can do much more to kind of reduce our reliance on those and also really helping people realize, no, they're, they're really not great metrics of in any way of your future potential as a doctor and a human being. So we should like make sure students recognize that that you're not defined by what you do yes. on a day. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Catherine, exactly. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of that. Michelle? Yeah, I think that's a great example of the normalizing that I was referring to. And I think ultimately, like our biggest challenge is just the way that the medical institution is set up as a hierarchy. And so if we could think about ways in which we think about kind of our growth mindset rather than being a pyramid, maybe it's more of a sphere. And we get, you know, 
more and more outside of our core and, you know, add more layers to that. And, um, and as we grow, so normalizing the fact that, yes, you're learning this. So we expect you to not know it all at the first time. We expect you to, you know, misstep and stumble and then get better. And so really that whole normalization throughout your um, four years, five years of medical school, so that you feel like, okay, when I look at this person, you know, they're not, they're doing a lot more than I am, but, you know, as Saba put it, you know, maybe they have, you know, more, much more privilege that they came from. And so not expecting to, for each learner to be at the same place at the same time. And so if we can think about each individual's kind of sphere and how they're growing in their sphere, um, that would be one thing. And then I think not just focusing on the individual, but the institution, right? So how can we as an institution really think about how we put out faculty development and have expectations of our faculty to be able to, again, normalize, to be able to show their own uh, vulnerability, that shared vulnerability. I think that's something that we have to teach faculty because again, we were, we were taught in this hierarchy. And so that's what, well, that's what we know, so that's what we do. And so um, just like we had to learn all about PPE and how to protect our patients and ourselves in the last couple of years, I think this is just as important and one of the things that we have to relearn and do as faculty and, um, and, and looking at it from that perspective as an institution, as an expectation of faculty, I think is our biggest challenge. That's really well said. I love the sphere metaphor. And I noticed there's a sphere in the background there. Uh, but I love the sphere metaphor. I think it's really, um, it's really a wonderful example of what we should be shooting for. Um, you know, Michelle, you know, in our institution, we have worked hard to sort of, uh, you know, formalize the process for what we call assessment for growth or assessment for learning. Um, which really does prioritize moving from wherever you are to the next step that you need to get to at the end of medical school. Um, but many people outside of our institution, and if truth be told, within our institution, um, raise a question about um, the concept of academic rigor versus assessment for growth. Like what, um, and I think some of this has been in existence in medicine. You know, the hierarchy is all about meritocracy, who is the smartest, or we call that assessment for ranking, right? Assessment for, for um, sorting. Um, but, and it drives a lot of, um, we found in our institution, a lot of maladaptive behavior, particularly in the clinical environment where students would perform because they got a better grade rather than ask questions which indicated they had something to learn. Um, or where teamwork wasn't as highly prioritized because people were competing against each other for that higher rung. So um, could you, um, maybe we'll start with Michelle this time, could you talk a little bit about how do we, how do we um, tackle that argument that if we don't grade students or force them into a competitive environment that they won't learn as much as we need them to be, that it's incompatible with academic rigor. We hear that all across the country as well from other, other institutions. I think maybe part of it might be just trusting in the system, right? In the, um, in the milestones that we've set up for students mm -hmm. and, um, and the, the paces that they've gone through at the end of, you know, matching and getting into their next uh, you know, part of where they have to go to the next part of that rung of the ladder, right? Um, trusting that that process works. Mm -hmm. And especially if the process is geared towards each individual student and their strengths. Um, and, you know, and maybe even just, you know, asking the learner themselves how they feel like they're doing and what they feel like they need to grow in and, and what they have the least comfort or the most comfort in mm -hmm. um, could be part of that. But um, I, I think that comes from an old way of thinking and um, and we need to, that's part of that, you know, hierarchy that we need to break down and um, really think about, you know, maybe it's more like 360 evaluations and patients evaluate you and those sorts of things and um, places where you can show the competencies that you've learned um, to, to be able to demonstrate um, the growth um, in different ways. And we even don't necessarily have all the different ways to, to be able to, to to, to look into that or to, to test for that, I guess would be the term. Yeah, that's a really good observation, I think. Stu, Stu any thoughts from you about yeah. how we wrestle with this um, rigor or what I call the, the rigor is, is only equated, but with competition? 
yeah, it, this is one of those things that drives me crazy a little bit, I have to say, in medical education. And I think in the pre-clerkship phase, especially, you get into this idea that, that you know, we have, we can't back down, we have to like push, 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 and, and students have to learn all of this massive information. And, and I, I think what's really unfortunate, and I'll speak a little bit of our experience at SPSU, was that, that there's no human endeavor where you continue to add more, 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 and it produces better outcomes. At a certain point, outcomes actually level off and then they start to drop. And one of the key things that we did at St. Louis University is, is we, um, we cut back on the amount of class time and cut back on the amount of um, information we were teaching. And ultimately, using the year two questionnaire from the WMC, what we found is our students reported spending an hour and a half to two hours less per day in class or study than the average medical student. Their mental health improved dramatically, but what was really impressive is their step one scores actually rose and the failure rate on step one was cut in half. So that we have this idea that more always leads to better performance, it's just absurd. And out of that, I mean, what part of the thing in terms of encouraging flourishing is the more flour students flourish, like the better they're gonna be able to achieve actually. So, so I think we, you know, it's such a centrally important thing, Catherine, you've touched upon that I think we need to really face um, and, and challenge this, this belief that somehow, you know, beating up on students is, is gonna make them, them better doctors. You know? So. Sorry, I muted myself because the dog was squeaking her toy. Um, she's flourishing, although it's hard to flourish on with her sitting next to me. Um, Saba, could you talk a little bit about like, um, how does it, how do you perceive um, sort of competitiveness um, or a sense of perfectionism um, in, in the medical students you work with or the medical students you have contact with across the, across the country, people that maybe you went to college with. Um, and what thoughts do you have about helping us get rid of that? Because you talked about, per, you know, the opposite of perfectionism was good. Um, and I'm going to translate that into perfectionism is bad for flourishing. I think it's a I think it's a really interesting challenge because I think medicine as a whole uh, attracts achievement oriented people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for a lot of us um, doing well on an exam, whether it's pass, no pass, or whether it's for a grade um, is just part of what we do. I, I, our, our, our grades here at the Medical College of Wisconsin are all pass, no pass. And I study just as hard as if it wasn't. Um, and I think most people do because I think at the end of the day, we're all here to learn. But the question of um, that competitiveness, I think is, is, is really a challenge because right now with um, many schools having pass no pass grading and our step one also being pass no pass, I think there's this extra layer of pressure that we're all feeling that if we cannot distinguish ourselves now with our grades, how else should we distinguish ourselves? So many people have numerous research projects or outside projects or um, volunteer opportunities, and then it just stacks and stacks and stacks. And so it adds to the workload. So there's this additional workload that we create now outside of school because we no longer have um, these grades to distinguish ourselves. And um, I think with that, so instead of now competing necessarily over the top grade, uh, people now compete over projects. Um, so it's a real problem. And I think um, one thing to address may even be uh, really redefining what success looks like um, for people who want to move into residency, you know, uh, maybe the evaluation is based on your character. It's not necessarily how many things you do. Um, I think uh, Dr. Guy had a great point about maybe it's from your patient evaluations, but I think something, something like that, because um, in a way, I think when you have very achievement oriented people, they're going to find more ways to achieve <laughs> even if you take things away. So it's, it's really, um, it's really quite complicated. And I'm not sure I have the, the answer yeah. to that. You know, it's fascinating. I remember talking to somebody at one point, they said something like to the effect of, well, do you know what they call people who are in the bottom half of their medical school? And I said, what? They said, they call them excellent. And he was really indignant. And I said, like, well, maybe they are excellent. And he goes, well, what do you mean? I said, well, they competed to get into a great medical school and they graduated without any issues. Um, they just happened to be in medical school with people whose numeric scores were higher. 
how do you know they're not excellent? And, and this whole issue too of, you know, competing for the right residency program, we should feel comfortable that all residency programs are right for somebody, right? You know, and so, so rather than trying to sort of say, well, you know, we don't have grades, but I have four research projects and you only had three, so therefore I'm better. Um, that doesn't make any sense, right? Any more than it says, like the residency programs want everybody who's top 10% in their class. That, that just doesn't mathematically work, right? So we should stop sort of aspiring to that. I want to focus a little bit and talk about faculty flourishing. Um, and, you know, there sometimes is this, um, what I would call fixed pie approach to flourishing, where if the students and residents flourish more, then that means the faculty flourish left, less, sorry about that, flourish less. Um, so I'm wondering, um, Michelle and Stu, uh, maybe we'll start with Stu this time. What does it look like as a faculty member to flourish? And how can we support faculty member flourishing if we believe, honestly, that you need to have a certain level of flourishing before you can help what they say, have an aspiration to help others um, flourish? So um, thoughts from you, Stu, and then we'll yeah. turn to Michelle and, and, and see if Saba has any ideas about uh, about how faculty can flourish. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Catherine. And I think I'll start by saying we did a little a small research project when I was at St. Louis University looking at um, third year students in the clerkship year and what were the things that kind of were distressing to them, disheartening, you know, upsetting to them. And, and strikingly, um, what I expected to be quite high was not, was, so it was mistreatment, was not ranked high. It, you know, mistreatment occurred, but it seemed like they got over it. The top two distressing elements were working with unhappy residents and working with unhappy faculty. So especially in the clinical year, we cannot expect students to flourish if they're in an environment where, you know, half the people are burned out or depressed or angry or frustrated. So I think that the investment this point is, is really saying, how can we help faculty flourish? I think if faculty flourish, it will help others flourish. And, and boy, we, I mean, we could spend hours on that topic, but clearly, you know, there's, there are tremendous stressors in the healthcare environment right now. Um, I'll just say briefly that, you know, people are focusing a lot on, on systems issues, workload, electronic health record, et cetera. And those are important, but I think what we also have to recognize, what's the culture of the place? What does it feel like? Is there a sense of community and connection? Do you feel appreciated and valued? Um, does your voice matter? You know, those are the kind of things I think we should be looking at faculty um, and, and really trying to support them much more than I think we have in, in you know, over decades, frankly. Some of the organizational psychologists who look at issues of burnout would say that, you know, more money is always better, but people can be um, burnt out and richer. Um, but sometimes what helps a lot is the leadership. So you were talking about that. That's a cultural issue. Um, uh, Michelle, what are, what are your thoughts about helping support faculty to flourish um, and then making them aware of the importance of helping them helping their students to flourish? Yeah. No, I think if you have um, a sick system, so to speak, so that your institution, you know, if uh, not just faculty, but like if the staff are unhappy, you know, that affects everyone too. And so you have to think about your whole institution and what you are doing for everybody's well being. You know, so without that, I think that, you know, ultimately that, you know, not only is the faculty not going to flourish, but the students aren't going to flourish. And so um, how do you then create a system where there is, you know, a focus on everyone's well-being, on everyone feeling like they can bring them best, their best selves to work. Um, they can um, do the, the extra things that they enjoy doing and feel like it's recognized um, as well. And, um, and I think, you know, really in the last few years, it just uh, the amount of um, attrition that we've had in the health system. Um, from staff and the shortages and so forth um, have had a real impact. And so we've seen that even uh, recently when we um, pulled our GME, our, our trainees, you know, how is it going? And it's like, well, it's okay, but, you know, I have to interact with these, you know, the nurses and the, the teams that, you know, are really struggling. And so if we don't really take care of the whole system, then um, the flourishing isn't going to happen ultimately. Mm -hmm. 
Interesting. Um, I do think that um, moving away from this idea that my flourishing is your to your downfall. Um, it's, you know, we do a lot of that. Um, we hear that a lot from the residency perspective as residents work fewer hours. Um, and it's really hard to sort of be committed to well-being when still fewer hours means 80 hours a week. Just try and figure out what that means in terms of day-to-day -day work. It means 12, more than 12 hours a day for six hours, six days. And none of us would take that job. Uh, but moving towards a more rational, humane, or flourishing, generating works, workload, people worry that um, they're going to have to pick that, pick up those issues. Um, what, um, let's go, let's go back to Saba and say like, um, how could, for example, a classroom teacher communicate to you at the beginning of a class that they care about your flourishing and that their class is designed to support flourishing? Um, I want to move us now into a conversation away from characteristics of flourishing environments to how can the structure of medical education be designed um, to facilitate these things. We'll just assume for once that everyone understands flourishing and they want, they want their students to flourish and they feel good about themselves. What would the structure look like where this became a reinforcing part of the work that we do? Do you have a thought from the classroom perspective? What could your teachers do that made it clear to you that they cared about your flourishing and that they had designed their course that way? I actually think we have some good examples of this at MCW, mm -hmm. um, which I'm very proud sure. to say. Um, I, I think um, I think there was a the comment earlier about achieving grades versus actually learning. Um, and I think one thing that we do wonderfully here in many of our preclinical classes really have this focus on learning by bringing in these case-based discussions early and creating small groups so that everyone is able to actually participate and have a say and have a thought and actually think through complex issues. Um, I think um, many medical students, if not all, we all come to school with this sense of curiosity. And I think in encouraging our curiosity, it really helps us to flourish when, um, when what we're learning becomes more about our interests or applications, it kind of starts veering away from, oh, I need to go through 1000 Anki cards today, which is another pit that some of us fall into. Um, so I think we actually do that really well, just in the way that the courses are structured. I found it very, very helpful. Um, and also to even speak to this uh, small group format, it really helps because I think, um, you know, we had discussed how the playing field isn't level, but it's also not level in many ways. Um, certain people may feel less encouraged to speak up and participate, but by making groups small and by providing people with attention uh, and encouragement, you really make sure that more people engage. So I think these are some ways that you can help students flourish. And in your environment, Saba, um, are those small groups sort of fixed? Do you follow the same people all the time? Is there some relationship or um, community that feels like it's developing? We've done it both ways, but actually um, this year we've stayed in, I think starting from last semester, we stayed in the same small group. And actually, um, we've almost become like a little school family. It's actually quite helpful. We, we have actually formed those connections and it's helpful too when you're, you're learning, if you feel comfortable with the group that you're with, you're more likely to be okay making mistakes or putting yourself out there. I will say when we have our doctoring classes and we're trying to come up with our differentials, I say all kinds of things because I know no one is going to judge me. So it makes me feel like I um, can think more out of the box about a problem um, mm -hmm. rather than being really worried on, okay, is this strictly by the script that we've been taught? So, um, so I do think that creating these little micro communities can be really helpful because you feel safe um, so I think that's part of creating this little safe space um, where I think um, getting rid of some of the anonymity of, of medical school and we have classes of 200 plus people. Mm -hmm. So there's a trust you're saying that develops um, amongst the amongst the groups. Absolutely. And, and a sense of kind of mutual goals and support rather than competition. I've, I have seen that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's really that's really wonderful. Michelle, um, I think you're Can a I just add something quickly. Um, that, is that okay if I add something to this? Just one second. We'll go to Michelle and come back to sure. you. Okay. Uh, Michelle, um, you're a coach, I believe, at, at UCSF, or have been a coach, and I'm yeah. I'm wondering what you think about um, the type of longitudinal relationships and how that might support flourishing. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, I think having a, a person, a faculty member who you know sees you three or four years, that, that's how the, our coaching system works, is really um, transformational. I think that um, they really get to know you. Somebody had asked in the chat earlier, like, you know, then you really have to know the students. And, you know, there is that one faculty member who really knows you and sees your, your growth over time. Um, and also knows what your strengths are, right? So knows what like your true north is and what you're working towards and like what you aspire to be. And so they can help you, you know, focus your strengths on different ways and um, also create that normalization I talked about. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, yes, you know, this isn't maybe your forte, but you know, you want to do this and you need these other skills that you're really good at. Um, so really helping the student um, understand that whole landscape and perspective of um, what medical school is like, not just like in the moment where they are. Um, and think also maybe if we could connect, which this is, this is what the CMC does, is um, really connect what the students are doing with patient care. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, um, you know, that's the goal is to take care of people. And so if we can connect the projects that they're doing and really show them early on, um, this is the impact you're going to have. Um, I think that can really encourage that, like Saba said, that that learning rather than feeling like you're checking off boxes and and did it, you know, all your Anki cards for the day. Yeah. Are you? Um, I, I, in, uh, tell me if this is a correct interpretation of what you just said. It also sounds like you think that that, that longitudinal relationship makes it easier for you to give growth-oriented feedback, you know, feedback that suggests that there is room for growth. Would you, would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I was in that first cohort of coaches, so now those students are second-year residents, mm -hmm. and so I still see some of them, right, as oh, wow, second-year residents. Great. And it's amazing, like, you know, you thought, you know, first day one of medical school, it's like, oh, okay, I didn't see you, you know, blossoming into this. But after you see that over and over, yeah. um, you can really help guide people and um, and really help them understand sort of what they're really good at and what their, their potential is. I mean, going back, first off, it's just wonderful to see your face light up when you talked about <laughs> seeing your, your coaching student from six years ago and remembering about like helping others grow and achieve their full potentials too. Um, you're going to get the last words before we turn it back over to, um, to Sarah to close us out. But um, give us your thoughts, your reaction to Saba, your reaction to Michelle, and actually any, any wise words to take us away. No, I, I completely love what they said, which is it's about relationship, right? And and community and connection and, and creating this environment um, of support. I think one of the things, and I, I don't know if I'm right on this, but but I, my, my belief is we need to create those positive things, but we also have to make sure we focus on the negative forces. And one of the things, I hope this is not as widespread as when I was a curriculum dean, but I, I, I really felt like in a lot of medical schools, Everybody knew that there were toxic courses. You know, there were one or two toxic courses and you could have this great environment, but there were a couple courses that just like threw way too much at the students or had really harsh grading systems. And I don't think we should, I don't think that should be acceptable anymore. And at St. Louis U, we took on one of these, what I think was an extremely toxic course. I, I didn't have the power in the hierarchy as a curriculum dean, but our dean did. And he said, you will not do this to our students anymore. And so I, that short course, you know, moved from being an extremely toxic course to a moderately toxic course. And that was good, right? We, we made That's progress. Growth. It growth. was growth. It was yeah. growth and it had a huge impact. So as we look to the positive, I think what we should, we should make sure is we're not ignoring the negative forces that can cause so much distress for students. So so these are some really good ideas for structural um, changes to facilitate foster, uh, facilitate um, flourishing, creating opportunities for students to join their own micro communities to support one another and trust one another because that's the way the world works in medicine. Um, helping faculty have longitudinal relationships and um, facilitating them seeing the outcomes of their good work. And I think really sort of making sure our courses are feasible, they're feasible to the students, and that we don't use grading and um, com competition um, as a core aspect of our pedagogy. It's it reminds me of that organic chemistry controversy that's been all over the New York Times, and people keep saying, oh, that's that's why you shouldn't have organic chemistry. There's nothing wrong with organic chemistry. It's how you grade it, how you teach it, and how you use those grades. That's 
negative. It's not the content, it's it's what we do with it. So um, with that, um, I just wanna thank the three of you and also Isabel um, in absentia. Uh, it was a fantastic conversation. I've seen lots of great comments in the chat. I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah um, for closing remarks and also remind people um, if you want to put Q&As in the chat, I think it will continue on for a while. And we'll what we do is we're gonna capture all of these chats and use it to advance our thinking as well. So thanks to all of you who put things into uh, the chat for our in reaction to our great panelists. Sarah? Thank you, Catherine. And thank you to all of you who shared perspectives. You've given us so much to think about and new different ways of thinking about some of these concepts. Um, Catherine, you did a wonderful job kind of teeing up some of the pearls of wisdom that stuck out to you. And we would like to invite the audience as well to think about what is one key lesson from today's conversation that you're going to take back and apply in your setting um, or kind of hold in your mind as you go forward. So Catherine listed a number, which I think are all fantastic ones, um, but we invite you to share in chat others that stick out to you and really synthesize what stuck out to you from this, this session. Um, I know for me, the shared vulnerability was so powerful as a term and looking for opportunities to create micro communities uh, really, really jumped out at me as things I'll take with me. We have some others building trust in small groups as a means of resilience, relationships, the empower, the important empowering power of relationships and forming those in different ways. Michelle, you spoke about the sphere. The sphere is going to stay on my mind uh, as I think about growth mindset and uh, just new ways of viewing how we interact in learning environments. So we welcome you to keep sharing those in the chat, really crystallize those learnings. Um, we also want to, again, thank our speakers, thank all of you who participated for the time and perspectives today. Um, and we'd be uh, you know, especially grateful as well to the Kern Family Foundation whose support makes the work of the KNN possible, um, as well as our event hosting partners for helping us with a smooth session today. Um, we also view today's session as just the start of the discussion on these important topics. So we do invite all of you to continue the conversation by joining the KNN's online community, which is our brand new virtual community of practice. Um, so we invite you to visit the address shown here, community.knncaringcharactermedicine.org to sign up and stay connected with your peers um, and fellow participants across the country. And as Catherine mentioned, if you have additional questions for today's panelists, they will be available for the next 10 minutes or so for additional Q&A. Um, so please do stay on the line if so. Otherwise, we appreciate everyone's participation and we hope to see you in the online community and future KNN events.